So thank you. I'm going to change gears a little bit again here um, and talk about the work we're doing that grows out of our effort in modeling nuclear fuel cycles. And our work historically has been looking at commercial fuel cycles, and one of the questions there always is at the boundary of concern for how commercial fuel cycles could be diverted into alternative purposes. And that's where so the interface is here. And, and most of my talk is going to be, hopefully I want you to see it as sort of a plea for opportunity for collaboration. One of the things that makes our work, I think, most valuable within CVT is this possibility of being able to use it as a test bed for putting together the way that different pieces of technology are being developed and seeing how they might work in a, in a synthetic system. So from ter terms of what we've been up to this year, um, we focused on proof of principle ideas of how we use nuclear fuel cycle simulation to support the CVT mission. And so to do that, then we created a number of toy problems on different capabilities to, to develop underlying capabilities and, and create this demonstration to, again, assist in my plea for your, your collaboration. And there's three primary examples. One is looking at behavior modeling of, the, of undeclared activities at individual facilities. Another is um, simulated signals, synthetic signals of time series to be used in anomaly detection. And in fact, we have a collaboration. Al Hero mentioned it this morning, and there's a poster we'll get to see later this afternoon of trying to do this. And finally, um, looking at the idea of adding spatiotemporal metrics to, for fuel cycle monitoring. And this dovetails in with some of the work that John Lee is doing and Al Alex presented this morning on some of the emissions. So the, for the first piece here, we've been looking at facility behavior models, and with this is our, being our simple toy problem, where we've modeled a set of facilities that are interacting with each other. In this case, what we're focusing on is what happens at an enrichment facility that may be, in, may be inclined to divert enriched material. And so for simplicity's sake, we've got the full uh, light water reactor fleet, an, an imagined full light water reactor fleet model as a single facility that's um, requesting material in sort of a fluctuating basis over time because it wants to run its commercial fleet. And there's an undeclared consumer that's occasionally requesting high enriched uranium and an enrichment facility that is constrained operating near its technical capacity so that if it, ever bought, if it ever decides to satisfy the request for high enriched uranium, it will limit its ability to provide low enriched uranium. Um, and so then we can um, do things like this where at uh, the top you see a simulated set of requests for low enriched uranium that's come in. These are being sampled at the moment from a Gaussian distribution just to provide some variability. Um, and then we see two different models. Um, obviously the first one on the left is sort of an oversimplified model where a, a constant amount of HEU is being requested. At oh, I'll keep my hands off. Constant amount of HEU is being requested uh, at a regular frequency. And then an alternative behavioral model, again, as a demonstration of what's possible, but not necessarily the most faithful representation of the real world, is a model where we have, again, regular amounts of HEU being requested, but being requested at random intervals of time. And as a result of that, what happens is in the bottom, then, are the amounts of LEU that are actually shipped to the fleet of light water reactors. And as Al showed this morning, when you get this very noisy data, <coughs> visually, you can't necessarily tell that anything is, any discrepancy has occurred. And the question is, can you tell um, by using some more modern data analysis techniques? Um, and so we did, we started doing some of that ourselves, but that was prior to getting engaged with, with Al's group. And so here you can see in one example, you can see the difference in the time series between what should have happened and what did happen and various kinds of uh, analyses that we played around with from a very simple point of view, the Fourier analysis on the left and and then fitting it to this Gaussian distribution on the right. Is, and, and you can detect certain things knowing something about the system. Um, so what, we're, what we have been doing, and I'm not going to details here then, is taking signals like this, synthetic data like this, and passing it off already to the group here in Michigan for them to attempt their anomaly detection techniques on that. Um, the last thing that we were doing then is looking at what are the kinds of metrics. So this, that, that, work, that prior work was based on a metric which is a time series um, single time series coming out of the facility. Another kind of metric may be uh, spatiotemporal data. And we've seen a number of different people talk about Krypton-85 or <coughs> looking at atmospheric transport of, of different isotopes. So we wanted to develop a capability, again, using a toy problem for that. And this needs three pieces. It needs some, uh, some way to locate facilities in space, some geospatial information or, or in some grid. It needs a way to model the signal propagation, some kernel for what that signal is going to be as it propagates, and then a method to superpose these. 
And so what we did here was, you know, here's our, our toy problem with two facilities shown in green here um, at the top and the bottom at these low x coordinates. And then there's a, undec a, a imagined undeclared facility shown at the red location. And so the two facilities in green are going to have constant emissions. And here's a little movie that shows, without, the, without going into the depth of the atmospheric transport modeling, I'll come back to the collaborations we'd like to work on there. But this movie here sort of shows the simplified kernel we have for emissions coming from a point. Right? And so this is a building up over time. And then it's going to be a steady emission moving over time. And so this is one kernel that we can put into the superposition of different signals that we might see. In reality, what we'd want this to be is an atmospheric transport model based <coughs> solution rather than just this toy kernel that we're using. Um, now, if we combine then, oh, next slide. If we combine then two, those two signals with one smaller signal that's puffing, if you will, right? So it has an intermittent release, right? So we have this one facility here and you can see before the system fully develops that it's got little puffs of emissions that are coming out at some frequency in time in the background of these two emitters that are constantly emitting. So again, if we had real atmospheric transport modeling, our point, purpose here was not to demonstrate our ability to do that, but to put these together in the context of a fuel cycle simulator where you can model these individual facilities behaving in different ways and look to see what the outcome might be of the metrics that they produce. Next one. So where are we going in the coming year then? Um, we want to focus initially on improved facility modeling. This is the part that so we've taken on to, to be our own without the collaborations, on, although we're welcome for them here, and to look at more, more complex models of agent behavior. So how will these different facilities behave? Obviously, we've used very simple behavior in these toy problems. We'd like to incorporate more complex behavior um, involving game theorists and other people on our campus in other ways, and looking at historical records, looking for ways that our models and our behavior can incorporate um, the mechanisms to represent inspections occurring at some frequency or based on some event. Um, responses to that, how will the agent behave having been inspected, not inspected, maybe a detection of some type happens, how does the agent behave in, in, in with respect to those things. Um, and then also look at um, questions about the types of signals we might see, um, both direct signals and multi-mode signals from either national facilities or multinational facilities. And this gets into some of the things that Frank von Hippel was talking about this morning, is being able to look at how uh, the signals from, from multinational controlled facilities um, may be larger, they may be more uniform, they may be varied compared to the signals we might see from a set of national facilities. And what does that mean for the types of uh, uh, security that we may have in those options? So I'm going to finish off with, um, I've also stolen Sarah's picture, of, or whoever made the picture, but from the, the uh, CVT overview, because uh, again, I want to come back to this idea that the cyclist fuel cycle simulator we have provides this virtual place to bring together different ideas of what's going on, uh, to look at a systems approach to all the different technologies that are being developed in the consortium. Um, so in thrust one, we're having conversations with Alex Glazer on this nuclear archaeology questions related to FMCT and uh, looking at facility modeling and how can we reduce uncertainty in terms of fissile material inventories from based on uh, the histories, the released histories of facility uh, production and operation schedules and what can we learn from that and how can that feed into this. Um, in Thrust 2 we've already of course been working with Al Hero and his group um, and the data analysis techniques. Here what we'd like to do is add some range of different kinds of signals. Right, so we chose these toy problems with these toy signals. What the feedback we need is what are the right kind of signals that we think we can measure from these facilities so that we can add fidelity and invest our effort to make those signals more representative of the real world so that his team has the kinds of signals that are realistic and make sure their algorithms are working on realistic signals. Um, and then also looking at generating coordinated time series. So what are the different signals that would come from a given facility or even the whole system and how can those be put together in as uh, whether they're of a similar type of, of signal or whether they have very different characteristics to, to make a, a bigger picture of what's going on. In thrust three I put question marks because I haven't really identified the best 
collaborator here, and I'm happy to have many of them, but really looking at what happens when we take some of these safeguarding technologies that are being developed as part of Thrust 3 and look at how those interact with the material flows happening in facilities as they transition between states and, and looking at the isotopic variations that might occur there. At least that's the way I've imagined this um, going forward. And in Thrust 6, the other thing that we can do in this education thrust is put together simulations that could be used in educational opportunities to show people what the different, you know, how, how fuel cycles might evolve and where the vulnerabilities might be in fuel cycles. So with that, um, and being one of the last people to hold us between the next phase, um, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Uh, we want to design, build, and test very compact reducing on detectors using room temperature detectors, specifically using 